And good. Hey, um, aloha, everybody, and welcome to another Dan and my friend Nathan that you can't hear, but uh, I see there, but uh, he's running the board. And today, just uh, just an update on how things are going. We've been having these get togethers a little more frequently uh, because it's been crazy around here. So uh, a lot of you, we've been meeting regularly and you kind of know what's going on, but I imagine there's a good chunk of you who aren't involved with the nitty gritty and just probably want to know how, how we're doing and what our plan is. So I'll go over that. And then I got a good number of questions also mostly around COVID and you know the situation in the hospital. We'll go through those. And if you have, again, any questions, put, uh, put them in your chat box. And I think Eva said to me that I see something that they're unable to hear me. Is that true? Uh, we, everybody, well, let, let me know if you can hear us, uh, can hear me, so we'll fix it. But uh, I don't see any other chat, so I think we're okay here. Yep, uh, we're good to go. So, um, well, how are we doing? So I'll just give you a series of numbers really over the last uh, seven, eight days. You know, our COVID has been, count's been 32, 33, 37, 37, 6, 36, 37, 34. So that's pretty much all flat. And uh, we've had a little decline here in the last few days, which I'm hopeful is continuing. Uh, but our ICU numbers have ticked up a bit, and they have been 17, 19, 19, 20, 18, 19 today. So that's, I've never seen those numbers, and most of our efforts really over the last week have been managing our critical care population, and not just the COVID folks, but still making sure we retain the capacity when people come in really ill and they need critical care, we can still deliver that. So that's required a lot of creativity and a lot of folks' part and a ton of hard work. Uh, which I'm very thankful for, but I do believe we've been able to maintain our quality of care despite, you know, almost doubling our ICU numbers, and um, that still remains our challenge. The numbers have crept down a little bit. We're using a little less ventilators, and again, I'm hopeful that we're starting to see a trend off. And one of the reasons I think that uh, for the state, and I'll give you some numbers on that one as well, um, 443, and then it was 412, and 409, and 393, 390, 396, 360. Those are the daily hospitalization counts, and they pretty much have gone down uh, statewide over the last eight days. And while every island's a little specific, in general, though, the, um, the state has roughly followed um, or followed the same pathway regardless of the islands that you're on. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, that also bodes well for us. So some overall numbers, unfortunately, there has been a number of COVID deaths across the state, but 98% um, of those have been in the unvaccinated. So again, get your vaccines, please. Um, we have had though about 15% of the vax of the hospital admissions have been people who have had a vaccine, um, thankfully, uh, most of them uh, leave here, or leave the hospital pretty intact and pretty quickly and don't seem to be uh, have severe illness. But certainly breakthrough infections, you know, with Delta, you know, have been an issue and you guys are all aware of, aware of it. I'm just so thankful that that wasn't the first variant that came through before we had a vaccine or it would have been a really ugly story. So... Uh, as far as what our plans are, I think uh, uh, a number of you are aware that we have ICU overflow areas in our uh, PCU, our progressive care unit. We have what we're referring to affectionately as ICU North. So there are six to eight beds, depending on how we configure them, that uh, also have um, ICU patients in there and because we have some additional monitors in that area. Uh, we, of course, have our normal ICU, and then in our PACU, we have uh, what was used to be used as an ICU overflow a couple years ago. It's like a ward, and we have four of our, uh, our COVID folks, patients who've been ventilated for quite a while. They're, we've concentrated uh, that population there because they are all pretty much getting the same type of care, and it's a very efficient and safe way to deliver it. So... Uh, hopefully, we won't have to grow that um, that population or those beds anymore, right? 
and um, I just uh, express some appreciation for those of you who work with surgeries and our, our doctors and our clinics. We have uh, reduced our surgical capacity by about half to be able to staff those areas, but uh, we're looking toward the end of the week to get more back up to normal volume and hopefully we can maintain that next week. Um, certainly, uh, we've had many staffing challenges and issues. Um, if we didn't have our uh, FEMA nurses, our nurses that uh, have come from many different parts of the country and are staffing a number of our different areas, if we didn't have that 30 plus group, I think we would be in a world hurt. Um, I think we would rally and all get in there and do what we can, but I think it would certainly have a really negative impact on our care. So you guys that uh, have come to assist us, thank you, and we appreciate your help. And I've been asked, uh, how long are those guys going to stick around? We, um, they, they come for eight-week assignments, and we've had about, well, really three, maybe four different waves or cycles. Uh, so some of the guys that came in first, uh, they will be cycling out in a few weeks, but we have others that have come in to replace them. We have a group coming in on the 20th and then on October 4th, and our goal is to maintain roughly that same number here through um, likely through the end of October. That will help us as uh, this surge hopefully tails off and uh, will also give us time to um, get our regular staffing recovered and maybe to get back to some sense of normalcy. Um, uh, you know, the COVID Delta pandemic obviously has impacted hospitals all over the country. You know, I was reading a story this morning that uh, in, I think it's in Alabama, every one of their ICUs are over their license capacity in the entire state. Uh, Florida, other places in the South have been hit tremendously hard. And then uh, pockets across the country, uh, you know, like in Hawaii and others are, uh, hospitals are very, very extended. It's made it difficult, certainly, for us to get um, additional, I guess, contractor traveler help, which make up about 10 to 15 percent of our workforce in normal operations. So we're doing a lot of efforts to um, align up that assistance for uh, October, November. It's a competitive market out there for sure. But we also are hiring a lot of our own. Uh, we always do a nurse residency program. Um, this year, we're doing an even larger one where we hired 30 uh, of our local kids, a lot of them. Well, some of them aren't kids, but for me, I'd call them kids because I'm probably older than all of them, but uh, we're glad to uh, be able to offer that program, and we upped our numbers because I think we are going to have to rely more heavily on our local market. Um, let's see if I have any more updates on how we're doing. Uh, on a somewhat, well, uh, probably not a related note there. Uh, we have gotten a lot of questions about boosters, and we did send out a survey we had 557 responses. Uh, so, and I'm assuming of those that all of the people who responded were vaccinated because I doubt you would respond and say you were gonna get a booster if you hadn't gotten your vaccine. But so 83% of you who've been vaccinated, uh, I guess, plan to get a booster. Um, and then we asked, how would you like to get it? And 30% of you said you wanted it like at a clinic in a campus setting. And the other 70% said you preferred to have someone come around like with a cart, like we do flu, flu shots and give you your boosters. So once all that, uh, all the rules around boosters get settled out as to who's supposed to get them and what age group and all, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty around that right now. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get something in place. And it sounds like if they become available, a lot of you will like to get them. I think I covered everything on how we're doing. Let's see what we have up there in questions before I get to your written questions. Uh, how many staff opted out of the mRNA mandate? Uh, what's the plan to replace those workers when they are let go? So I had a lot of questions regarding vaccine mandates and what the impact will be. So I think I'll cover your question. Actually, I did get the actual question is how many, I believe what you're asking is unvaccinated. So we have around 1,500 employees in our various 
locations and affiliates and so forth, and 181 are not vaccinated at last count. That may have changed since testing requirements started uh, through the governor's order. Um, we've heard that some folks have decided they would just rather get vaccinated. So that number may have shrunk a little bit. All right, so I'll just get right into questions here. Uh, put some in the chat box if you want some clarifications. It says, regarding mandated policy for those FAP employees who elect to be unvaccinated. I think what they're saying is regarding the policy that people have to get vaccinated, I guess. It was said they are responsible for all testing costs if they decide to do so. Currently on the local news, they state per Hawaii law that the employer is responsible to incur the cost of testing and also for employers to be given time off to do the testing, just need clarification on this topic. I'm sure this will have impact on the employer if that statement's true. So I asked Dawn to respond to that. And I think we, from what I'm reading of her response, it came right out of the governor's proclamation. But it said employees are expected to use a free vaccination testing sites to fulfill the testing requirements since this option is available. Uh, employees who choose to not use the free testing sites will then have to bear the cost of the test since they are opting to not use them. Uh, employees can visit the County of Hawaii website for the community testing schedule. I think she added that in there. Um, employees who test during their regularly scheduled work hours may apply for sick leave in accordance with the applicable collective bargaining or provisions or executive orders as operations permit. Uh, employees who do not have available sick leave must be placed on leave in accordance with applicable collective bargaining provisions or executive orders. Now, a lot of um, a detailed response here, and I'm glad um, Don gave that. But I think bluntly, um, when it comes down to testing, if uh, you decide to take advantage of the testing exemption, right, and instead of being vaccinated, um, you Basically, that's a choice by the employee, and if they can get um, um, free tests, then we certainly are glad to take those. However, if for some reason you cannot get it, you want us to provide it, uh, the employer, the employer, I believe, shouldn't bear the cost of that because, again, it's an exemption that is voluntary on the part of the employee. You know, people ask me bluntly, is this, is this designed to encourage people to get vaccinated? Absolutely. All of these mandates and rules and OSHA requirements and all this stuff that's coming down is absolutely a public health objective to get people to get vaccinated. So I think people who, and there's no need to sugarcoat it, the more of us to get vaccinated, we can put this thing behind us. And, you know, um, a lot of folks with some authority or whatnot are trying to encourage as much as possible, make it easy but also perhaps nowadays, as I think our president said, make it a little more difficult to not be vaccinated. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the questions. Uh, is there a date that HR labor will have all exemption requests reviewed by? So um, HR labor department will begin this process once you get all the exemption requests in and they are all due by September 21. Um, determination letters will be issued to employees no later than October 5th. So uh, they have to get them in by the 21st for religious or medical exemptions. And then I had some, also some questions regarding um, exposure, uh, well, regarding COVID-19 and if patients, well, I'll just read the question. When an employee is exposed to COVID-19 by a positive person, person, patient or other employee at work, why is the employee not tested through the entire incubation period? So Chad answered these for me. Uh, he said, per CDC, you're supposed to get tested three to five days after exposure to someone with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, wear a mask in public indoor settings for 14 days after exposure or until they receive a negative test result. Most fully vaccinated people with no COVID and light symptoms do not need to quarantine or be restricted from work following an exposure to someone with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 if they follow the testing and masking recommendations below, above. 
So, you know, the difference between how we treat vaccinated people and unvaccinated people post exposure and the testing regime they follow, just follow CDC. We didn't make them up. And CDC has made a distinction between the two. I understand that a lot of folks ask the question, well, that distinction has gotten a little blurry because there are breakthrough infections and people who've been vaccinated can get COVID. And I would agree it's not perfect. But uh, I mean, for lack of better uh, guidance, I don't know if you would say there is better guidance, but we follow the CDC uh, mainly because we need expert advice and that's as best that we can have. Uh, if someone contracts, uh, why are vaccinated staff excused from weekly testing if they could possibly be quietly carrying and spreading COVID? So per CDC, fully vaccinated people can refrain from routine screening testing um, if feasible. So that's just what they say. If someone contact contracts COVID-19 per infection control, they can test positive up to three months. That is true. Uh, if you are vaccinated, you're asked to stay home for 10 days, 10 days quarantine and return to work with no return test needed because you are no longer contagious after five days. And that's also true. However, you are, if you are in, unvaccinated and survive COVID-19 because of the new procedures, we are required to test weekly even after the 10-day quarantine. If the unvaccinated employee tests positive, their job is at stake. So I don't know that your job is at stake if you test positive because we generally you go out and quarantine. So I don't understand. I don't know about that particular comment, but like stated per infection control, they can test positive for up to three months. Please answer how this is fair. When both employees can test positive, but it's okay for the vaccinated person to walk, to work a walk amongst not just other employees, but as patients as well. So, Per CDC, yes, you should be vaccinated regardless of whether you've had COVID-19 because research has not yet shown how long you're protected from getting COVID-19 after you recover from it. And vaccination protects you even if you've already had COVID-19. So I think if you just distill those rather long answers but detailed ones all down, it basically says there are two standards. Um, you're, the standard is much more rigorous if you haven't been vaccinated and less vigorous um, if you have been. So uh, there are some reasons for that because vaccine, vaccines do offer some protection both for the person and also on your ability to spread. It's not perfect, but it's better than if you didn't have it at all. So I'll look there on the right there. Let's see, what do we have? Uh, even though we had to turn in the attestation form by September 7th, we are able to change our mind on what box we checked. So um, Dawn may be on that on this uh, Zoom here, and if so, maybe she can ask because I don't know that question, uh, know that answer. Uh, if you want to make a change to your form, uh, but I imagine you could probably call HR and they could pull up your form and and you could make the change, or maybe you could go down there and do it yourself if you wanted. You didn't want people to change it for you. So why is the unvaccinated being forced to get weekly testings when we ourselves admit that even the vaccination can still get infected with COVID-19 as well? Even the vaccinated can still get infected with COVID-19. Um, why are we being forced to get weekly testing? Well, I mean, the, the simplest thing I can say is uh, it's, it's the governor's order and we're a state facility and we agreed to go along with it. And that's kind of the easy answer to it. Um, I think it still all boils back down back to the point that when you're unvaccinated, you are at higher risk and you don't have the protection. And so when you are unprotected and at higher risk, um, the I guess the requirements for testing and other measures are higher or maybe are not the same as if you're vaccinated. And I know those lines have gotten muddied because of breakthrough infections, but those bluntly are the rules. I know that everyone doesn't agree with them, but um, that is the policies that we follow. Are there any plans to help employees with childcare again, schools and care facilities being shut down left and right because of one child test positive? Um, uh, short answer is no. We, you know, even in the when we first shut down, we really couldn't get into the childcare uh, 
operations. It's just not something that we do, but I do empathize for you. Uh, it's got to be enormously disruptive. I've been a big advocate of keeping schools open. You know, when, when my opinion was asked, should we shut down? Should we go back to remote learning? Uh, for many different reasons, not just their education, but also the impact on our workforce. Uh, I really think that's a bad idea. So I hope that doesn't become more frequent. Uh, I think I mentioned, uh, with, I got a question for the ICU staffing about the FEMA nurses. I mentioned about them coming September 20th and 4th, so I won't do that question. Um, oh, it, this is a more fun question. Is HMC part of the free hotel for healthcare workers program? And if so, do you know what hotels are involved? I don't know the exact hotels. I know there were about 50 of them statewide, and there are some uh, on the island. Um, well, the process is, is that we as an organization collect names and we send those names or requests to uh, Healthcare Association of Hawaii, which does a random drawing because this is a statewide thing. And um, I guess people are notified. We just got the details or some of the details of the program in the last couple of days. Uh, so Mari Hariki is the point contact for this. We are uh, triaging though to direct patient care staff. I know everyone has chipped in here, but by um, uh, by far the toughest burden has followed on our nurses and our aides and our support staff that care for patients at the bedside, includes our physicians as well. So we would encourage you guys to self triage and unless, you know, unless you've been there in the thick of it here in the last uh, few weeks to, um, you know, limit your requests. Uh, I think that is certainly intended as a thank you for individuals who have really put themselves out there. Uh, of all the patients we have on ventilators, how many of these patients are vaccinated? So currently of our nine, we have nine patients right now on vents, uh, all are unvaccinated. And certainly we've had more. I didn't ask for the data going back for months, but today we have uh, nine folks who are um, COVID positive and it's on ventilators and every one of them are unvaccinated. Um, let's see. I already did the testing costs one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's a, oh, staff who are not vaccinated for whatever reason, why are only some staff approved to take their COVID test for free and others have to go outside either to pay for their own or try to get the free testing when it's just when they're working? I don't believe anyone is getting free testing uh, here unless it's for exposure. So if you were involved in an exposure and you happen to get tested that week and um, you are unvaccinated and have to meet the requirement, we're not going to make you go out and get another test. But you're not getting a free one because we're just, you know, being nice to you. Um, it, uh, you just happen to have a test result from, you know, exposure that we felt should be followed up with. So I don't believe anyone is getting a free test uh, from us. Uh, you're supposed to go to the free sites to be able to do that. If that's occurred, I think it's an anomaly. Um, I got a, a kind of a statement more than a question uh, about some staffing issues at Kau, and for those of you who put that in, I'm not going to read your long question, but I did refer that to, um, you know, the management team there, and I hope they can answer your questions. Um, this one's a, a, a little pointed question, but I think it's one worth, uh, certainly worth reading. Uh, so I'll just read it as it says. It says, the short staffing every shift of every day is deplorable. I'm drafting a complaint to Joint Commission about the unsafe staffing ratios. The stress on my body every day is unacceptable. And so when I read that, you know, I certainly gave that a lot of thought because we been dealing with staffing and it's been a major challenge here over the last month with this uh, current surge. Um, you know, the hospital right now, we're functioning at over 30% over our normal full level. Wow. So 
uh, one day we had like 146 patients in here. And our ICU is 180% of capacity. That's what it's been running here for the last week. So absolutely, this creates a ton of staffing challenges. So, you know, everyone has had to step up. What happens at every shift, our health supervisors and our nurse managers all look at the staffing that we have and look to how we can deploy those in the fairest and the safest way possible. And some days, you know, it's tight. And some days it's really stretched. And I would say on most units, it's not what you would call normal. So, you know, you, there is certainly some validity to, you know, this comment here. Um, what we have done is I've mentioned already our FEMA nurses, but we've had over 300 additional staff, uh, uh, excuse me, additional shifts covered by people volunteering to come and helping hands or to work extra shifts uh, and so forth. And I know everyone is pitching in. So uh, I know it's been tough. I think we're in the same boat as almost all the other hospitals here in Hawaii. Um, but, and I share your concerns. Um, and, you know, um, I think Joint Commission is probably hearing this from all over the, co the country, but I believe that we're doing our best. And I do believe that while it's not perfect, we've been able to meet most of the requirements, really almost all the essential requirements for patients at pretty much every time, but not easily. So for all of you out there who are best in your behinds, thank you. Um, we've got some questions here. Uh, let's see. If we receive the vaccine at HMC, do you have the records? Yes, we do. Um, we have them in our van, ZAM, VAM system, and um, everyone who got their vaccines uh, here at the hospital we provided, we logged them. So yes, the, you are in the system. Um, do all uh, islands measure hospitalization numbers in the same way? Um, our COVID, post-COVID, long haul, well, I'll answer our COVID, well, let me do the first one. Uh, do all islands measure hospitalization numbers in the same way? That one's a tricky question because uh, Department of Health collects numbers, and I think over a long, you know, a several day or maybe even a week period, the numbers are pretty consistent. There's a lot of variability uh, on any one given day. So where I get my numbers is uh, I'm actually part of a, of a text group of my colleagues, fellow CEOs at the 13 acute hospitals um, that every morning we report our numbers. And then um, actually our Lieutenant Governor, he's a physician, has been heavily involved with this, Lieutenant Governor Green, he's on that. And um, we basically add up what the hospitalization numbers are and we get a very real count. And then also, so it minimizes a lot of variation from island to island. And we really look at what's in our hospitals. And since we run our hospitals, we generally have pretty accurate numbers. So it's been a way to get around what I imagine some of you, some of you follow these things, a little frustration because the numbers sometimes seem to be all over the place. Um, our COVID, so in our numbers, when I'd like to say we have 34 today, it counts those that are within the COVID 20 day period. So if you've been here more than 20 days, we take you off the list. So we certainly have long haulers or people who have been we came in with a COVID diagnosis, have gone past their 20 days, and unfortunately, they're still sick, and they may be with us many more days, and they came in for COVID, but they're not in our count because we don't do a cumulative. We do what's active COVID in your hospital right now. All right, and have we been seeing any children coming in with severe COVID? The short answer is no, and we haven't admitted any. Um, I know there have been certainly kids uh, who've gotten the COVID and the Delta variant, but thankfully we haven't had to admit any here. I believe there has been a couple in the state at, in Kapiolani, but I couldn't tell you exactly how many. Uh, let's see. Even if that statement was true and the unvaccinated had a higher risk, isn't it irrelevant if the vaccinated can still and spread COVID-19? If we honestly want to keep everybody safe, then it's logical to test everybody, both vaccinated or unvaccinated, in case it appears to be a certain group or employees person are being harassed or discriminated. So I do think that you have a point in that 
it's not perfectly clean where unvaccinated folks uh, are the only ones who can get COVID and people who are vaccinated cannot. It's just um, the ones that are vaccinated have less chance and much less chance of, uh, enormously much less chance of getting seriously ill. And they also have, uh, they're less likely to spread, but not every time, but still less. So it went from being an absolute to being now a bit of a gray area. So then you ask, well, why doesn't everybody test? Well, probably because it's not feasible to really do that. And the other is if you have to pick to do testing, you probably should do it with those who are at the highest risk, both of contracting and getting sick, but also spreading it because this surge has been a Delta surge mostly around the unvaccinated. Only 15% of the admissions uh, have been people who have been vaccinated and they don't stay very long. This whole thing we're dealing with is in our unvaccinated population. So I guess the question is, are you getting picked on a little bit? Yes, probably are. And I think some of it is to encourage people to get vaccinated. That's just the truth. Um, is the employee on vacation, are they still required to do weekly testing? Um, I don't believe so, but I think you should check with HR to be sure. Um, and then someone said Pono's question was missed. Uh, will flex schedules again be offered? Um, I think that, so always, I think, I think you may be, oh, I know what you're referring back to, Pono, probably regarding um, schools and when people start and so forth. But I think uh, what we've done before is that, you know, has to be discussed with your manager and probably uh, up to your EMT um, is to basically a case by case basis. So uh, we're not gonna take a across the board approach to it. If for some reason, you know, I, gosh, I hope not where schools all go back to remote learning, I have a feeling we'll have to do uh, some of the accommodations we did before, but we're not quite there yet, but we certainly will keep an eye on it. And uh, why wouldn't a PCR taken here at the facility be not credited, taken at the field be not credited to, I think it, it, what I was saying, it would be credited. So if you have a PCR test that you took here at the facility, say for this week, and you needed to meet your weekly requirement, it would count. Uh, I think that was our point there. I'm assuming that that comment uh, taken here at the facility uh, meant that if you got one for reasons other than meeting your test, weekly testing requirement, would it count? And I believe it would count. I didn't see any reason why it wouldn't. Are there stats on the number of positive employees? Yes, I think uh, Chad keeps them. Um, so I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but we've had some. And then also here, let's see. Uh, so I think this is a comment here on, I won't read the whole thing, but on extended care and we have ECD North open. And I know that there's been um, thoughts of how we gain access. We don't wanna be going through the facility uh, unnecessarily, but we also don't want to, uh, um, be out in the rain. So I know we are looking at access on this. So I'll just tell you, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can figure out something better. Uh, there are many studies showing out now out showing that natural immunity to COVID is at least as protective as mRNA. Why isn't this being discussed? So again, this kind of goes back to we follow what the CDC and the latest guidance is on this. And I know there's controversy out there that um, some people say that natural immunity is the same, and but I think what Chad has told us from our research and the research he's done is really not established how long that natural immunity lasts. Um, so we really don't get into sorting all that out. We leave that to the scientists and we come out with what we follow basically what you know, the regulations are because I'm hopeful and I believe that the regulations are based on what the science says. Uh, can staff work 10 plus consecutive days in back-to-back -back shifts, 18 hours a day when signing up for Pono pay shifts? You know, I really don't know. Uh, basically for Pono shifts, we put out our needs 
And uh, I believe that you have the, some of the basic rules is you certainly have to work more than your FTE and you have to, um, it can't be just for any reason. It has to be for those areas of need um, that were, I think, were put on the sign up list. One of them, our administration executive said it won't be credited to the employee's weekly testing. So I'll take it that he or she wasn't accurately briefed about this topic. Um, that's always possible. It could be that they made a mistake or they didn't understand your question, or I don't know, because this, I'm just hearing you recount this. But again, uh, our goal, if, if you've had a test during the weekly period for you know whatever reason, and it's a valid PCR, we certainly are going to count that test. There's be no reason for you to turn around and take the exact same test and actually just to, quote, make you pay for it. But please call HR the, uh, and employee health, and they'll clarify that for you. It's not our intent to be jerks about it. All right. Uh, okay, still have a few more questions. Is that for making this that? Oh, well, we have one more there. Are there opportunities for clerks to do overtime? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think that on our sign-up list that we were looking for uh, support staff there. Uh, most of it was directed toward uh, direct patient care staff because certainly that's been uh, the area that we were short in. And it says staff are working 18 hours a day for 10 plus days. Uh, for 10 plus days, other staff are making that is not good. I would agree that 18 hours a day for 10 in a row is as much. I think. I've worked some long stretches, but 18 hours is a whole lot. It doesn't give you a lot of time for sleep. I think what should happen there is that, you know, the manager of that unit should be aware and make the assessment of the individual and check with them and make sure that they are, um, you know, able to do their job well. Some people have more stamina than others, but that does seem to be a whole lot. Uh, it's a good point. Still have a few more here. We're getting to questions, a lot of interest in the stuff that's going on. Um, why are we not taking, talking about employees who are vaccinated that are positive and allowed to come back to work, especially from traveling back and forth from the mainland, mainland where there's no test needed? So uh, ask Chad to look into this. He's not aware of any vaccinated employees who are COVID depositors allowed to work without first completing the 10-day isolation period. It is true that no test is needed for fully vaccinated tra uh, people traveling to and from the mainland, um, but there, so I answered that one. So with President Biden's executive order, will he or she, that he will or he did sign, does it change anything with the HHSC employee mandatory vaccinations? So that's a really good question. So President Biden, I think a few days ago, um, he came out with his intent to make um, for all healthcare workers, or excuse me, for healthcare workers that work in any healthcare facility that takes federal uh, money, so Medicare or Medicaid, which really is about every every healthcare facility, those workers would have to be fully vaccinated uh, without uh, the testing exemption. So we have every reason to believe that that uh, requirement will be put into effect. And given the fact that, well, we certainly can't exist without Medicare or Medicaid dollars, and those are cover many of the members of our community, we will have to fully comply with that. So um, I would expect that while the governor's um, order is in effect and we are following that, which is vaccination with a testing exemption, uh, I think over probably in the next few weeks, uh, it will be supplanted by uh, President Biden's order uh, when it comes to Medicare, Medicaid, and the requirements, if you take the money, you got to be vaccinated. Um, I think what's going to be challenging for a lot of individuals who you know are concerned about that, that covers pretty much the entire healthcare industry. I know there are some you know, lawsuits and others that are planned, but there's actually quite a bit of established case law that allows this. And if I would imagine every one of you that 
got a job here in almost any healthcare facility have had to have some level of vaccinations um, because I, I've worked in healthcare for 25 years now and every employee I've worked at from nursing homes to hospitals and all had to see my shot records and required me to have certain numbers of vaccines, uh, whether it's hep B or, you know, or measles, rubella, whatever. So that's been well established as a reasonable requirement of employment. And so I don't, I'm, the most of what I'm hearing and reading is I doubt that uh, that requirement will be somehow considered unconstitutional. So I think especially with Delta's recurrence here and the fact that we're all getting our behinds kicked again um, has really reduced the tolerance for ignoring that lovely tool called vaccines. So uh, I think if we're gonna stay in healthcare, most of you may wanna consider getting vaccinated. Uh, there was a question about uh, a temporary COVID clinic in the parking lot, but uh, that it would be, I think it was referring to our plan to do the monoclonal antibody or Regeneron clinic and offer that service. And we were gonna utilize the space across from the ground conference room. Uh, I'm not completely up on the actual flow of the patients, but I believe we still are planning to have those patients come in uh, and have a controlled access, you know, then come down the back stair or go up. And if they need um, to use the elevator, they'd be escorted. So we won't have them, as you would say, kind of wandering around the hospital. So I know there's a lot of attention being paid to um, reducing exposure and controlling access to the Regeneron clinic. I'm really reluctant to put up the tent because I don't think that um, it's frankly a very inefficient way to utilize space and what our biggest shortage is, which is staffing. We're almost to the end here, uh, running a little long. Uh, when will we be taking the booster shots? I mentioned that. I really don't know. The FDA came out with a pretty mixed review on uh, when people should get booster shots. And you know, I think the latest was, well, they think 75 plus was what was being talked about along with immunocompromise, but it was very um, ambiv uh, ambiguous. Uh, it wasn't clear data on if it would benefit those that were younger. So I still think we're gonna, uh, it'll be a while before we know about booster shots. Where's the hold music? Uh, so when you go on hold, it's gone. And I said, really? And yeah, I got them to check and it is gone, but it can be put back on very easily. Uh, it actually is a setting and we can put almost any kind of music that we would like on for the whole music. Uh, no one could really tell me why it went away. So we'll be sending out a survey with about four choices as to the type of whole music that we're going to play. Because you can do like classic Hawaiian, you can do classic rock, you can do country, but I think it would be kind of fun. So You'll get a survey out and then we'll figure out which one is uh, the consensus and then we'll that will be our hold music. It'll come back on. So when you get put on hold, you can get some tunes. Um, why can't we tell patients they may not come into the hospital unless they are vaccinated like the visitors? And then there's kind of a long little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a rant why we should do that. But bluntly, patients aren't voluntary. You know, they come here because they have to have the care versus visitors. If you're not vaccinated, you know, you don't have to come visit. So it's a little difference in prioritization. And then, of course, our patients are, are our mission. We care for them regardless, you know. Uh, we don't really get into why you're sick or why you were in that accident or why you... I don't know, did that stupid thing and hit your head, uh, we pretty much just take care of you. And I think that applies also to vaccines. Uh, let's see, um, are would they planning on shutting down visitors due to the influx of COVID patients in the other units? Uh, so no, we're not. Uh, we've gone through a month of really our worst outbreak with a controlled visitation process and screeners at the front and requiring vaccinated visitors. And so I think we're gonna stick with that. I don't have any plans to change that one. And can we get the booster at HR if we're not at work? the day they come around with a cart. I think, well, yes, we will try to work into something where people can, uh, if they don't see the cart and we don't have the special clinic open, we'll have an access point where you can get the booster. 
we may even well it depends on what the demand it is art to uh you may be possible to just dip in there and get one too um let's see i thought this was you know worth uh um, reading here even though it was a little bit of a perhaps of a venting session but uh, but i understand that it's about our ECD. You guys have had to make a lot of accommodations here in the last a couple of weeks with us opening ECD North. But you said, why is ECD the redheaded stepchild of HMC? We aren't on the logo. So um, I don't really think that ECD is a redheaded step stepchild. It is uh, a department, though, of Hilo Medical Center. And it's been a department for years. Remember, we used to have the old... Um, SNF med surge up in the main hospital, right? And that was another department. So the reason you aren't on the logo is because Hilo Medical Center is your logo. Um, there are some questions here about, you know, how we staff there and so forth and care for our respiratory patients, but I'll pass those on to your manager and we can uh, take a look at your concerns. Uh, will booster shots be mandated at HMC? The answer is no. Uh, do we need to still take the flu shot if COVID vaccinated? Uh, yes, I would highly recommend it. We never made that mandatory. Uh, we just incentivized it, and uh, we would strongly encourage you to get the flu shot. Remember, the coronavirus and the influenza virus are two different. They're like cousins, but they're distinct cousins. They're not first cousins. They're like third cousins, and yes, you need protections from both. Um, Let's see. Why would you make staff pay for testing if not vaccinated? Wouldn't that make short staffing more a problem? I would think we pretty much covered that one. Um, staff who have had two shot vaccines and got COVID, will they need to take a booster? That's an interesting question. If you, I would imagine, had a breakthrough infection, would you need to take the booster? That is a good question. I don't really know, um, but I'll try to look into that and see if there are some of the studies out there that have made, um, um, have looked into that. And then the last one, this actually came up last time. I forgot to get to it. Uh, I'm sorry. And then you put it in again. So thank you. But the question was, uh, the upper parking lot, could we move to zone parking? I think this was someone who works in either BH or the quality or the, uh, you know, the modular building or the West Wing and said, well, you know, it's very central parking to us. Could we get stickers that let us park there and go to a zone parking kind of system? Um, and the short answer is, I really don't think we can do that. Uh, we haven't done that in the past, but you know that upper parking is also pretty central to most everyone who worked in the acute hospital itself. Uh, it certainly is closer than some of the locations across the street. So really everyone would probably want to have that zone. So I think once we go down that road, it becomes very difficult to manage. So. Uh, there's no plans for that, but thank you for your question. And let's see, are we cut, are we cutting visitors hours down from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. again? I don't, uh, like I said, we didn't change anything last time. We kind of felt that after we talk about it pretty much every week, but um, so I'm getting notes passed to me here, but we're cutting down. We're not planning to change the visitation. Um, it's the Pfizer vaccine we have available from available here in Hawaii, FDA approved or still under EUA. Um, so the Pfizer vaccine, thank you, and the Moderna va no, Pfizer vaccine was approved by the FDA, I think, August 30th, roughly. I know it was in August before Labor Day. So it is fully FDA approved. Um, so um, I don't really never heard the FDA approved version. It's called Konamate and is not available to the public. Um, that's a new one to me. Uh, but um, I know the FDA did approve the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Uh, I don't understand that word. Well, maybe it's, I think there's a key word in here. I don't understand the word. So 
Oh, wait a minute. Testing to meet government mandate is for those identified as close contacts. Oh, here we go. It says testing to meet the governor's mandate is for those identified as close contacts directly by HR. So I think what we're saying here is this was to your question. If you had a PCR test, does it count uh, done here at the hospital? Does it count for your weekly test? And I think the clarification is here to use that. Um, you have to, it has to be a PCR test that was obtained because of close contacts and it has to be approved by uh, human resources or I guess employee health. So I, I would imagine uh, they probably want you to give them a call and ask them, hey, can I use this test to meet my requirement? And I think, let me see, now let's see. Oh, okay, this is from Alan. So if those of you who don't know, Alan, she is our pharmacy director and thank you, Alan, for answering that. So community comité, I don't know how to pronounce that word, and the existing Pfizer vaccine are identical in content, only difference is the label. So I think that both of them, I guess they're all, they're basically the same thing. So yes, the Pfizer BioNTech is the same and it is FDA approved. So that was a lot of questions to get to uh, get through. I hope I didn't make everybody glaze out here, but I do think there's certainly some uh, good questions and a lot of interest around here. Um, so uh, we'll do one of these well as we need. And uh, I do well, before I close. I do want to thank a, a number of folks. Certainly, all you ICU folks out there has just been killing it. We appreciate it. Our house supervisors, um, who, well, those who've been covering for our house supervisors and our um, Emily and Julia, our night guys who've been working pretty much alternating for like the last month. Thank you for really stepping up, stepping up and for your leadership. Um, and then all you guys who picked up those extra shifts uh, and, po and our needs and those of you who have worked short and our FEMA nurses. And um, our doctors, our team health doctors, who I think are up now to their, they're up to six teams or seven to cover all these patients. And I know that are really killing it. Thank you, Dr. Kanas and our intensivist team. Uh, thank you. And our RTs uh, who have never seen so many vets in this place and our ED guys. Uh, thank you all. You're doing a great job. Appreciate it. Aloha.